Vanessa Martin grew up in New Orleans and spent high school writing overwrought poems, in her own words, as every writer must. Now she writes charming stories for middle readers. The stars are adventurous cat brothers Anton and Cecil, cats on track and cats at sea. Writing about animals who speak and think like people is often tried and rarely successful. Like E.B. White and S.E. Hinton, Lisa Martin finds their voices. The New York Times praised her delicate use of language and the series remarkable, engrossing, and unpredictable. Book list cheered her, peppy, humorous dialogue, adding that the story was fast-paced and engaging. Aspiring writers, remember where overwrought poetry can lead you. Second up, or perhaps first up, I don't know who's first or second, <laughs> second up, is Erin Estrada Kelly. Raised in Lake Charles, Louisiana, Erin's debut novel, Blackbird Fly, an ALA notable children's book nominee, about a Filipina girl, a Apple Van Gogh, who is the only Asian in her school, a hard situation made worse when she finds herself in the dog log, a list of the ugliest girls in school. Quickly followed by Land, by Land of Forgotten Girls, a top 10 multicultural books 2016, in which Soldad makes up stories as a temporary antidote to the pain in her life. After her mom and sister die, Soldad's dad moves his, the remaining daughters, Soldad and her younger sister Ming, from the Philippines to Louisiana, where the girls are eventually left with an evil stepmother. Soldad's stories about being rescued by their fabulous Aunt Jove keep them going, but then Ming believes it will happen. Her third book, Hello Universe, won an SJL Best Book of 2016 Gold Award. That's pretty great. Uh, Hello Universe was also a winner of, well, sorry, that's the same thing. I'm repeating myself, but anyway, thank you very much, and let me introduce them. Hello. Thanks, everybody, for coming so much. It's great to see you. Last year, I think, at the festival, it was pouring rain, and everybody came anyway, So, but it's a little less muddy if we do it this way. Um, so I'm Lisa. Uh, the, we were originally called Animal Tales, and now we're called Unexpected Odysseys, both of which uh, happen in our books. Um, mine is a tale of two cat brothers, Anton and Cecil who live in a seafaring town in Nova Scotia in the 1800s. This is the third of their adventures, Cats Aloft. The first was Cats at Sea, and the second was Cats on Track. So they had adventure around in a lot of different ways quite a bit. Um, the, so you might notice we have co-authors, Lisa Martin and also Valerie Martin, same last name, not a coincidence. Um, Valerie's my aunt. So she's an adult author and has written many books for grown-ups, um, mysteries and adventures and romances. And so she and I decided to collaborate together where she would write something for children. And I had written a lot of children's poetry, and so I decided to write something along. We got together that way, and it was really fun. We are very similar. We have the same sense of humor. So we had a great time all the way through. So. At the time, we, I had two, I still have two sons who at the time were eight and 10 years old and we liked the idea of brothers for our main characters. We both had cats, so we decided that they would be mischievous, curious, able to get in and out of tough situations. So we made the main characters cats who were brothers. And then my grandfather, that's the same as Valerie's aunt, was a ship's captain. All growing up, he would sail all over the world in a freighter. And because there was no internet, the only way that we could find him was by looking at atlases, maps, you know, trying to pinpoint where he could be in the world just based on when he left and where he was going. And I think that idea of just mysterious what could be out there, he would come back with stories of some good things that would happen and some really horrible things, sometimes just mysterious things that were 
happening out in the middle of the ocean, unexplained, and never really explained. And so we like that idea, too. So Anton and Cecil are very different the way siblings sometimes are. Friends, and they help each other, but they are sort of irritate each other, too, sometimes. So Anton is sort of a stay-at-home guy, likes taking naps, listening to music, likes hanging out in his lighthouse home, not really interested in adventuring. Cecil really likes to get out there, try everything, eat everything, um, and is really curious about the ships that he sees way out from the lighthouse. Where are they going? Where have they been? Sometimes he sees whales on the horizon, wonders about that. So he would really like to try an adventure, but it's not, it's not him that goes. Anton is taken off the docks by sailors who need a cat to um, be a ship's cat and save the ship from mice and rats that eat the stuff that's down in the hold. So he's sort of catnapped, stolen, and these almost go after him on another ship. So they adventured sort of separately, which allowed Valerie and I to each write a cat. So we were in different parts of the country, so that worked well. So, and our cats sort of mirror our personalities, which was fun too. Then, um, because of the 1880s time frame, we picked that because we wanted ships to be the main way that anybody got around. And we learned all about ships, the historical time period. I really liked researching all that. That was the best part to me. And then we kept going with the second book, Cats on Track, because the Transcontinental Railroad had just been established across the US. And that was a whole new treasure trove of funny creatures, you know, interesting lands, and an adventure where they went west um, along the railroad, which they called land ships, as opposed to the seafaring ships, because they floated across the land. Then in the third book, the, the publisher said, well, we've been on the sea, and we've been on land, and so now there was really nowhere to go but up. So we had to put them in the air, but there was n no means at that time there were no planes or rockets so the only way to get them up was a hot air balloon which in 1893 at the chicago world's fair there were hot air balloons so that's where we set the third book and it it was it worked out perfectly and you can imagine cecil is the one who gets himself caught in the balloon and anton has to follow and that one is more like a mystery um where they help a uh, detective dog solve a crime where puppies are being stolen uh, from the fair. So let me just give you a flavor. So I'm going to put this one down. Can I do that? Step over here. So here's a little here's a little scene. So. In the course of their adventuring at the World's Fair, Cecil manages to get himself caught in a hot air balloon. The man in the balloon, the man in the green hat, thinks that he has a, one of the stolen puppies in a basket, but is surprised to find that he does not. And then this is a little bit of what happens after. Cecil understands that he's in a basket of some kind, but he doesn't realize they're up in the air. Then Cecil looked up, and his heart leaped. A balloon, a gigantic green balloon, towered over them in the cloudy blue sky, tilting and billowing in the wind. The gondola, which Cecil finally understood they were riding in, pitched and swung as the ropes connecting it creaked like the timbers on a ship. I've got to see this, he thought, abandoning all caution. He darted out from behind the bags to the top of a crate. Clinging tightly with his claws, Cecil leaned out to take in the view, more astounding than he had ever imagined. So this is what birds see, Cecil thought. I'm actually flying. He blinked a few times to clear his dizzy head and gazed down at the wide spaces inhabited by tiny buildings and the curves of narrow blue rivers winding through the fields. Train tracks ran in dark stripes across the land, and away to the right lay a vast body of water glinting in the sunlight miniature ships moving slowly over the surface. The ride was so quiet, unlike the blustery, chuffing trains that Cecil could hear the voices of people on the ground and dogs barking. Some of the people looked up at the passing balloon and waved their arms. Why did humans like to do that so often? 
But he had little time to enjoy the view as just behind him, the man in the green cap began talking to him again. I don't know how you got in that basket, cat. The man huffed, adjusting his cap and straightening his coat. And now we're off course, thanks to you. He grabbed the dangling ropes attached to the great balloon, tugging on them and looping others around the metal hooks sticking up from the floor. Cecil watched from his high post as the man worked to bring the balloon under control. The man yanked hard on a slim rope dangling from inside the balloon, and Cecil heard the sharp hissing sound. Uh-oh, muttered the man. As he surveyed the ground again, Cecil saw the fields and rivers below getting nearer. Where will we land, he thought. He gazed up ahead and gasped. The balloon was sinking rapidly, and Cecil didn't like the looks of the landing area. Great cats in heaven were headed directly for the lake. The man was frantically throwing anything he could find, a barrel, a chair, a metal box, even the basket Cecil had come in over the side to the lake. I'll be next, Cecil thought, and sure enough, the man turned on him with a gleam in his eye. Sorry, Tubby, he said to the man, lurching across the deeply slanted floor to where Cecil stood. I don't think so, thought Cecil. He leaped down from the crate and slid across the floor to the other side. The man turned his attention to the crate, which went over the side and made an audible splash. The balloon was going down fast, like a sinking ship. The man lurched into the ropes, hauling them this way and that, grasping at the stiff edge of the balloon itself. Cecil pulled himself by the claws to look over the side of the gondola. The churning water was beckoning with white-topped waves. So close now, Cecil let out a frightened yell. We're gonna crash, the man said, and in the next moment, with a sound like a diving whale's tail, the gondola smacked into the water. The balloon widened and flattened overhead, descending gently like a rain cloud. Cecil dropped back on the floor with one question burning in his brain. Will this thing float? I'll, I'll use this. Okay. Hello. Okay. Oh. Hi, I'm Erin. And I'm going to talk about my newest book, Hello Universe. And then we are going to open it up to Q&A. Um, so Hello Universe is my third book, and one common thread that kind of runs throughout each of my novels is um, championing the underdog. So I'm a big fan of underdogs. Um, I think they make for great stories, and uh, when I thought about unexpected adventures, I, I mean, uh, unexpected odysseys, I thought, you know, every book that we read or write uh, has some kind of odyssey in it. There's always something happening. It doesn't have to be a big grand adventure, but the character goes through something and changes at the end, right? Um, and even our lives, every day is, is an odyssey in and of itself a lot of times, even if we don't notice it. So each of my books have a lot of interior uh, thought and evolution in the characters because I write coming of age and because I write about underdogs. And usually my characters are rather quiet, shy, and unassuming. Um, and when you're quiet, shy, and unassuming, you tend to not get into big grand adventures <laughs> because you're all those things. Uh, so there's a lot of interior growth that happens in my characters. But Hello Universe is a little bit different because there is an actual external adventure that happens with Virgil, who, is, who opens the book. So the book opens with 12-year-old Virgil Salinas, and I'll tell you that the first sentence of the book, which will tell you something about Virgil, is Virgil Salinas already regretted the rest of middle school and he'd only just finished sixth grade. Um, so Virgil is painfully, painfully shy. Because he's so shy, he doesn't really have any friends. His best friend is his guinea pig, Gulliver. And Virgil is very upset because it's the last day of sixth grade, and he has not spoken to a girl in his special needs class whom he really wants to talk to, and her name is Valencia Somerset. And there's two reasons that Virgil hasn't talked to her. One is that he's very, very shy, and the other is that Valencia is deaf, and Virgil doesn't know how to talk to someone who is deaf, and he's already self-conscious. So then he's even more self-conscious because he's worried that if he talks to her, he'll make a fool of himself and he doesn't know what he's supposed to do. Um, so the novel opens with him lamenting the school year gone by and him having not talked to Valencia. So Virgil does see every Thursday a girl in his neighborhood named Kaori Tanaka. She is a fortune teller, she's 12. 
Um, he sees her every week so he can tell her, tell him his future. And he goes to see her to ask her if she can help him gather up the courage to talk to Valencia. So the part that I'm going to read to you in the book is what Kaori does is she tells Virgil to find five stones and bring them to her so she can work her magic and bring them together. So Virgil vent ventures off in the woods, and what happens is he encounters Chet Bullens, who is the bully. This book is told from four points of view. So one of them is Virgil, the other is Valencia, the third is Kaori, and the fourth is Chet, who's the bully. And Chet terrorizes both Virgil and Valencia. Um, he terrorizes Virgil because Virgil is shy and awkward and has no friends. And he terrorizes Valencia because she is deaf. The difference between the two of them is Valencia is not shy at all, but she's also friendless. The reason she is friendless is because the, the other kids at school, she's, she goes to a mainstream school, um, they don't really talk to her. They just kind of pretend she's not there because they don't know how to be friends with her because she's deaf and she had friends, but then they didn't want to um, go through all the trouble of doing the how-tos, which is how to talk to her you know, face her dead on, speak slowly, um, and don't cover your mouth. Um, so her friends kind of abandon her, so she's kind of left alone. And she's going solo, but she says, solo is the best way to go anyway. I don't need friends. Um, so whereas Virgil can, you know, is obviously hearing and can communicate, he doesn't know how. And Valencia wants to communicate, but nobody's communicating with her. So Virgil is setting off to find these stones to bring to Kaori, um, and that is where his unexpected odyssey begins. And I have to tell you that because Virgil's best friend and his, is his guinea pig, Gulliver, Virgil finds out that guinea pigs are social creatures, which they are, and they're not supposed to live alone. And now Virgil feels terrible. He spends a lot of time feeling terrible. Uh, <laughs> Virgil feels terrible because his, his his pet guinea pig, Gulliver, doesn't have a friend. So he starts taking Gulliver with him. Um, and what he does is he gets his backpack and he stuffs fleece blankets in there and he puts Gulliver in the backpack. And uh, he carries Gulliver with him so that Gulliver will have company and also Virgil will have company as well. So this is Virgil going through the woods to meet Kaori. Of all the treats in the entire world, Celery sticks, baby carrots, orange slices. Gulliver liked dandelions best. It took him less than five seconds to eat an entire stem, and then he'd root around for more. For Gulliver, dandelions were a rare delicacy. For humans, they were noxious weeds that needed to stop growing, but grow they did. Dandelions were everywhere in Virgil's neighborhood. They sprouted from the cracks in the sidewalk, leaned against rusty fence posts, sneaked into well-manicured lawns. Virgil plucked them habitually, like an explorer searching for gems. By the time he reached the woods, his left pocket was stuffed with them. He could have stuffed the other pocket too, but he was saving that for the stones. He wasn't allowed to explore the woods alone. The trees were thick in some places and sparse in others. Flowers grew intermittently, a patch of iris here, a camp colony of dandelions there, Lola was convinced, Lola is Filipino for grandmother, Lola was convinced the woods teemed with snakes, but Virgil was certain that he could find five stones here. And not just any stones, but the best stones his town had to offer. He found two right away, just a few feet into the woods. Deeper in, the sounds of the neighborhood faded away and he found another just like that. He was so focused on looking down, surveying the ground with his eyes, that he barely noticed the ominous rustling sound behind him. But when he heard the shuffle of feet, he jerked around, heart pounding, and stood very, very still. If there was one thing he knew, it was that you had to stay still when faced with forest beasts. Otherwise, you could become their supper. He didn't see anything, but he was certain he heard something. And it wasn't the blowing of the wind or the falling of a twig. Someone or something was moving nearby. Hello, Virgil said quietly like a croak. He thought he heard something, a growl, a snort. He suddenly got the idea that there was a rhinoceros on the other side of the trees, pawing its front hoof in the dirt, bowing its head, steadying its horn, ready to charge. 
He imagined himself being flung into the air and landing on the thick gray skin of the giant creature before being trampled. One of Lola's old ghost stories popped into his head too. She said there was once a man who told all his secrets to the trees and after he died, the trees whispered them to anyone who passed by. Maybe it wasn't a rhinoceros, but a bunch of old trees that were ready to tell the secrets of the dead. Virgil looked at his phone. It was 10.15. Maybe he'd just snatch up the next stones he saw and rush to Kaori's house. She might not mind if he got there early. But then the shuffling sound receded and disappeared, and the woods were quiet again. Virgil exhaled. His heart slowed. He looked at his feet, saw a fourth stone, and put it in his pocket. He wondered if he'd pick the best ones. He wondered so deeply that he didn't hear the other shuffling sound, this time approaching from behind. Hey, dummy. Virgil turned around, startled. Chet Bullen's meaty face was a light shade of red, like it was ready to burst. What are you doing out here all by yourself? You lost your mommy? It occurred to Virgil that the bull was also out here by himself, but he wasn't about to point that out. Instead, Virgil said nothing. He stood there, one pocket full of stones and the other full of dandelions, feeling very dumb, like someone had lifted him out of one story and placed him in another, in these unfamiliar woods, in this unfamiliar situation, alone with the bull who was carrying a pillowcase. Virgil wondered what the pillowcase was for, and in the space of about three seconds, he thought of a handful of terrifying scenarios. The bull would smother him with it. He was using it to carry the bodies of animals. He was going to capture animals, smother them, and then carry them. And Chet wasn't just carrying a pillowcase. He was also wearing a Chicago Bulls t-shirt. Before Virgil left the house, his Lola told him to beware the color red, okay? So when he sees the Chicago Bulls t-shirt, he, you know, it's red, obviously. Suddenly, the rhinoceros didn't seem so bad. What's the matter, the bull said. Oh yeah, I forgot, you don't know how to talk. I see you going into that stupid class all the time. What goes on in there anyway? A bunch of kids wetting their pants, I bet. In addition to being afraid of the dark, carrying a guinea pig in his backpack and stuffing his pockets full of dandelions and rocks, Virgil had another secret. He weighed only 70 pounds, and even though he pretended to be five feet tall, he was actually four foot 11. Virgil wasn't sure how much the bull weighed or how tall he was, but he certainly weighed more than 70 pounds. You really are stupid, huh, the bull said. His eyes shifted to Virgil's backpack. Chet took a step forward and Virgil took a step back, which the bull thought was hilarious because he immediately broke into peals of laughter before ripping Virgil's backpack off his shoulders with such force that Virgil spun, actually spun, and hit the ground with a numbing whack that shot from the palms of his hands to his shoulders. The bull took off like a bullet. Virgil pushed himself up and ran after him saying, no, no, in the loudest voice he could manage without choking. Gulliver, Gulliver, he cried. Only maybe he said it in his head, he wasn't sure. The bull darted between the trees, not laughing anymore, just running with Virgil's backpack in his hands. A million horrifying images blazed through Virgil's mind. The bull tearing Gulliver in two, feeding him to a pit of lions, picking him up and tossing him into the trees, which is why he didn't feel any better when the bull finally stopped running and turned to face him, his cheeks flushed and his neck and hairline glistening. Virgil waited for him to open the backpack, discover Gulliver and destroy him. Instead, the bull took a giant step back, grinned evilly, and turned toward a stumpy circle of stones that Virgil had never noticed before. It was an old well. With two hefty shoves, the bull pushed the cover of the well aside and dangled the backpack over the now open hole. Say bye-bye to your stuff, he said. The bull let go, and the bag fell into the dark, gaping well, so far down that Virgil didn't even hear it land. Guess you'll have to get new books, pansy boy, the bull said, his smile widening. Not that you need them anyway, since you probably don't know how to read. The bull wiped his hands on the front of his jeans as if he had just finished a dirty, dirty deed, which he had. Then he turned and walked away, disappearing into the woods and leaving Virgil all alone. Thank you. I think we have a lot of time for Q&A now, so I hope you have questions. Yes. Thank you.
Fuck you. I'm wondering from the very beginning, did you decide to do it from the four perspectives or was that something that evolved? Or? It was actually um, going to be two perspectives originally. It was going to be Virgil and Valencia. And the original title of the book was Virgil and Valencia. But um, Kaori was such a uh, unique character and she's a lot of fun because she's a psychic. Um, so then I started writing from her perspective and then I thought, well, maybe I need to put Chet in there because he's a bully, that's another interesting perspective. So then it became the four points of view and my editor said, we can't call the book Virgil and Valencia anymore. So I had to come up with a new title. So originally it was just the two of them. Thank you. I also really loved Hello Universe. Thank um, you. And what really stood out for me was the relationships, like Virgil with his grandma and Cardi with her sister. Um, but what really intrigued me was Chet and his dad, um, because you don't often get sort of that background story of why a bully becomes a bully. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So um, there is a chapter in the book and there's some references between Chet and his father. Um, and the scene where you first meet Chet and his father is they're grocery shopping and Chet sees uh, Valencia in the grocery store. And he asks his dad, who he very much admires, what makes people deaf. And his dad says, some people are just born defective. And he said, why did you see one of them in here? Because sometimes they give them jobs to do them a favor. So it's very much like a um, kind of a, a informal conversation, but it's those little seeds that get planted in kids' brains when you speak like that. The challenge with Chet was I didn't want to make him very sympathetic. I still wanted him to be just a mean person because <laughs> some people are mean. I mean, that's just the reality. Um, so it was very hard to kind of temper Chet with being um, trying not to make him one-dimensional, but also trying to explain why he is the way he is and it's because he learned it from his father and it's not as if his father's like punching guys out or pushing them into the shopping carts the the bullying is very um it's kind of covert you know just making passing comments about other people and using words like defective and etc thank you <laughs> anyone else have a question for our authors can I ask a quick question? How did you, how did Hello Universe come to the fore? The, uh, the title? Yeah. Oh, how did the title come? Okay, well, so my editor said, we can't call it Virgil and Valencia anymore, so you have to come up with a new title. And she does this to me all the time, like every book. So then I'm like, what about this? What and she's like, um, but she sends me an email back that says, um, and a bunch of ellipses, which, which means, um, no. Uh, <laughs> So, and she'll be like, oh, th those are interesting thoughts, ellipses, you know. Um, so Hello Universe came about because there's a lot about the universe and fate in the book. And um, the hello has a, several different meanings. So it's, you know, Virgil not being able to say hello to Valencia because he, he chastises himself by saying, well, how hard is it to say hello to someone? You just say hello. But for him, it's very hard because he's so shy. Um, and then the universe has Kaori with her fate and her psychic abilities and all that good stuff. Yeah. Are you able to tell us what you're working on next? I am. Um, <laughs> my next book is called, actually, another example of where I came up with the title. And she's like, um, no. Uh, so the title is finally official, and it's called You Go First. And it is uh, another uh, realistic fiction, middle grade. And it has two characters, Charlotte and Ben, and it's from each of their perspectives. And Charlotte and Ben uh, are both very, very gifted students. And they connect over a Scrabble app on their phone. Ben lives in Louisiana, and uh, Charlotte lives in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Um, they both come from very uh, you know, prestigious families. Their parents went to Ivy League schools and all this kind of stuff. But, they're very much outcasts. So Ben is an outcast because he likes to wear slacks and ties to school. Because um, he says you should look how you want to, dress how you want to feel. And he wants to feel like a president, so he dresses weird and the kids make fun of him. And um, Charlotte is just kind of generally awkward. 
And so Charlotte is going through, um, her family's in upheaval because her father has had a heart attack. Her parents are much older than traditional parents. Um, and Ben's, fam Ben's parents got a divorce. So they're, it's kind of their, both of their perspectives as they navigate this new universe that they're living in. Um, what is your um, like habit for writing? Like, do you do each day or like? Uh, no, I don't do it each day. Um, and I don't know if you do it each day, but. So when I started writing, I read all these books and they're like, oh, you get up at eight and you write till noon or you get up at this time and you write till this time. So I tried that and then I would just stare at the computer and I felt like I was doing a homework assignment. So I really don't like doing that. So my rule is I write when I feel like it. But the good news is I always feel like it because I love doing it. So I don't really have a process except that I write longhand first. That's the only thing that true, stays true and I always have an outline. So I outline in longhand and I write the draft in longhand and then, and then somehow, you know, I write something. <laughs> I'm an outliner also, but, some, but Valerie is a free hander. I can't remember the opposite. But, you know, some people need a map and some people can just do it like, let's just see what happens next. And that's terrifying to me. Valerie always says if you can write one page a day, you know, the old, then you get magically 365 pages at the end of the year and whoa, you have a whole novel. Um, and it just never, I mean, you can do it for like three days and then you fall off the, it, you know. It, it would be, some days there are a lot of pages come, but some days you have to just do research. We had a lot of historical research to get all the details right and I really rely on that like a crutch because it gives you something you feel like you're doing and making progress. So you get all the research and then you can use it, uh, details. And it makes the whole process easier. But just writing magical things out of your head is hard. Yeah. A dialogue can be a role and can take you pretty far. But when the next thing has to happen and you don't know what it is yet, it's pretty, it's scary. It's also isolating. You, you know, you sort of just wander around your house <laughs> doing other things that don't necessarily need doing. And so it's a funny process, I think. Any other questions? Okay. Any closing comments? <laughs> closing comments? We, the only other thing I was going to say is when we were talking about before, when earlier this was an Animal Tales panel, <laughs> when we talked about that, um, something that authors have to think about a lot is what characteristics they want their, in, in our case, animals to have. So. You can have animals that can talk to people or ha are wizard cats or, you know, magical cats or future cats or, and, but we worked really hard to make the cats just be cats, communicate with each other and other creatures in the way that they, you think they probably are doing, you know, it, if you have multiple pets, they're communicating somehow, you just don't hear it. So we always, they couldn't tell what people were saying, they couldn't read signs, they just had to make their way through the world guessing by like repeated things or things that looked like things were happening about what might be gonna happen next and sometimes they were right and sometimes they weren't. But we worked really hard to make them just have to exist within the world of their existence. But since they're talking cats, our books always are called fantasy, you know, like in, like in with wizards and cat, you know, it's not real, it's, they're just talking cats because they can talk to each other, not, <laughs> not to everybody, so. It's really historical fiction, I'd say. And I would like to say we have a signing after this. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> um, but that's not my parting word. My parting word was going to be that um, even if you don't buy our books, or obviously you're readers and book lovers because you are here, that I would encourage you to read something outside of your world. And what I mean by that is all my books have Filipino main characters. You don't have to read my books, but I'm just saying as an example, my first book, Blackbird Flies, about a Filipino girl growing up in the South, and she is the only Asian in her school, as was I, um, and her experience is growing up, you know, outside of a, a culture. And what's interesting is um, when I go to schools and I speak, when I grew up, I was very embarrassed of my heritage because I was teased all the time and I didn't look like anyone else and I, I was already, like, self-conscious constantly. Um, 
and nobody knew where the Philippines was. You know, they didn't have the internet or anything. Uh, so when I go to schools now and speak and they've read the book and to see them drawing maps of the Philippines and talking about Filipino food, it's, it's so surreal because I grew up so ashamed of my background and then you know, now these kids know where it is and what kind of food they eat. Um, and another thing that's amazing to me is how many kids will relate to books, not just my books, but in general, about experiences that aren't their own, but because it's so universal. So Apple is teased because she's, she's different and she's put on the dog log, you know, the list of the ugliest girls in school. Everyone thinks she's Chinese. They make fun of her for eating dogs and all this stuff. And even though that's not everyone's experience, obviously, um, kids from all backgrounds will write to me and say that they were just like Apple. And these are white kids, these are African-American kids, they're Indian, it's like every group. Because we all know what it feels like to feel like an outsider. But I just like to encourage people to maybe read something that's outside of what you normally gravitate towards. So you can you know, expand your world and your worldview. So that's it, thank you.